<laughs> it always says. Hello, hello. Uh, hello. Happy Tuesday. Welcome everyone to our webinar for today. Thank you so much for your patience. Uh, we had a slight hiccup with our technical uh, setup today, so uh, we just needed another extra couple of minutes to get that sorted out. Uh, again, I appreciate your patience, and we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so my name is Heather Grant. I'm one of the community admins here at the Maintenance Community by Upkeep. Um, thank you once again for making time to be with us this fine Tuesday. Um, I will drop a link on how to sign up for the Maintenance Community on Slack in the chat in just a moment in case you are not yet a member with us. Uh, today, we have Adrian Messer joining for a presentation on Rethinking Lubrication, a Condition-Based Approach. I am looking forward to learning a lot. Uh, the recording from our session today, as well as a copy of the slides that you see here, will be available uh, in the Maintenance Community Slack tomorrow, with that recording being available for viewing right after we end our session today. Uh, Adrian himself also is available in the Slack group uh, to answer any questions live, so please feel free to send him a note there, as well as the contact information will be shared at the end of our presentation today. Uh, feel free to share this recording of the webinar as well as the invitation to Slack with friends, colleagues, anyone else you know who would benefit from learning from Adrian as well. Um, and I think that's it. Oh, uh, <laughs> if you have any questions that come up throughout the presentation, please feel free to use the chat on the right hand side of your screen there. Uh, hop in, say hello, let us know where you're joining from. And we will uh, be sure to answer them uh, at the end of the presentation as many as we can. We may get cut off a little bit on time today just because we did have a, a, a little bit of a delayed start. Um, but anything we don't get to, we will answer offline in the Slack community. Uh, so please, again, feel free to join us there. Now I think that's it. <laughs> thank you once again for your patience. Um, Adrian, thank you for making time to join us today. And I'll turn it over to you to get us started. OK, awesome, Heather. Thank you. Appreciate the introduction. And uh, yeah, appreciate each one of you taking time out of your day to uh, sit in on this webinar. And thanks to Upkeep and the maintenance community for hosting all these great events. Uh, certainly a lot of uh, good learning opportunities out there uh, since a lot of us have been you know, tied down to our desks a little more than normal over the past uh, year or so. But it's uh, certainly encouraging to uh, see uh, a lot of places opening up now. So uh, again, thank you for that. So uh, good afternoon, uh, good evening for, from uh, wherever you may be watching. Uh, I'm here in South Carolina, uh, where we're really starting to feel the heat and humidity uh, being down south uh, near, I'm actually near Greenville, South Carolina. So uh, that's where I reside. Uh, but uh, again, thank you for being here. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, you'll walk away having learned uh, how a, a more condition-based approach to lubrication can really help you with your equipment reliability and asset condition management. Um, I visit a lot of different plants and facilities. Matter of fact, I was in one this morning, and uh, and lubrication was the centered, you know, topic of of concern there. Uh, so uh, it's really become a big topic in the field of structure-borne ultrasound. So. Um, again, appreciate you all being here. So uh, I'm going to have Heather advance the slides for me. If you're not familiar with UE Systems, uh, just to give you a little background on who we are, uh, we've been around for almost 50 years, uh, surprisingly. Uh, our headquarters is in Elmsford, New York, which is about 25 miles north of New York City. Uh, and it's, it's amazing, and it's, it's attributed to the fact of just how uh, many people now are using airborne and structure-borne ultrasound for condition-based maintenance, uh, but we, we have a global footprint, uh, and you know, we've grown tremendously in just my almost 18 years with UE Systems. That's how long I've been in, in the ultrasound and, you know, the reliability industry. Uh, so we, we've actually helped, you know, aside from making the instruments, we also helped to develop some ISO standards. Uh, there are a couple of those, so I'll give those just for reference. If you want to look into those, uh, there's an ISO standard for recommended use and guidelines for the technology itself. It's ISO 29821. And then there's also an ISO uh, standard for uh, training, which is ISO 18436. Uh, so just wanted to give you those for reference. Uh, aside from making the instruments, we also provide training. Uh, we offer level one or category one, category two certification courses in ultrasound. We also have some online application specific training courses. So if you have an interest in compressed air leak detection or electrical inspection, or uh, this case with bearing condition monitoring and bearing lubrication, 
maybe even steam trap inspection. Uh, we also have a class that's really on reliability centered lubrication. So it really doesn't even mention anything about ultrasound, but it's a course on how you store, handle, filter, and deliver the lubricants that you're using. So uh, that course is centered specifically around lubrication. Uh, all of those are available online. Uh, most of them are anywhere between five to six modules. Once you start it, you have up to a year to finish it. Uh, most people will complete it over the course of, say, a month or you know six weeks or so. Uh, but a tremendous amount of resources available on our website, uh, most at no charge at all. So we also have a series of webinars that we've been doing. So all those are archived on our website and available for your viewing pleasure. Uh, next slide. So just to kind of set the stage here and to, to kind of talk about why this has become such a huge application in the field of ultrasound. Uh, you know, one, it, you know, it's a challenge that a lot of plants, a lot of facilities face. Uh, and I tend to see more failures due to over lubrication than I do under lubrication. So a lot of the places I go, again, you know, we're looking to improve the reliability of our equipment, one, uh, but then also specific to lubrication, we're looking, looking at how we can improve our bearing lubrication practices. So ultrasound will certainly help, uh, especially if you're having a significant number of uh, bearing failures or equipment failures due directly to lubrication. It will let you know when you've applied enough grease in order to prevent under and over lubrication. So we'll kind of talk about how it ties into existing time-based lubrication procedures. So that's how I see most of people lubricating their equipment. You know, we base it off of timed lubrication PM. So we go out to a particular bearing every month, every six weeks, every other month, and we apply a certain amount of pumps of grease to that bearing. That's what we do. Uh, not that there's anything overly wrong with that, but, you know, it tends to err on the over lubrication side. So meaning too much too often. We'll talk specifically how, you know, really uh, the best approach is going to be for setting up routes to where we're collecting uh, data on those bearings and we're setting baselines and then setting alarm levels. So we'll talk about a lack of lubrication alarm and then we'll talk about another alarm to where, that bearing is now in a failure mode that is beyond a lack of lubrication. So ultrasound will let us know when it's in need of grease, and then it'll also let us know when that bearing is in a failure mode that is beyond a lack of lubrication. So the point to where that bearing has started to show some wear or fatigue. And then, you know, there's some uh, new methods that are available now that allow for remote continuous monitoring of bearings. And then uh, the ability to tie in a single point lubricator or an automatic lubricator that will apply grease when it when the when the sensor senses an increase in friction. So it becomes not only remote continuous monitoring, but it also becomes more prescriptive based lubrication, meaning that we're applying the correct amount of grease a little bit at a time until that friction level falls back down to a more normal or baseline level. Uh, next slide, please. So then we talk about, you know, the failure modes uh, of, of bearings. And if you look at any study, and there have been a lot of studies done on why bearings fail, uh, but this particular study is, for, is an SKF study that was done. Uh, it's referenced pretty frequently, so you may have seen it before. But, you know, in that SKF study, you know, it says over 80% of premature bearing failures can be traced or attributed to lubrication related issues. So, again, those bottom four there, whether it be insufficient lubricant quantity or not enough grease, uh, long time without renewing. So that kind of means, you know, long time without proper lubrication. Uh, unsuitable lubrication, you know, there we're talking about using the wrong grease for the wrong application, and then lubricant contamination. And that could be a whole separate webinar, a series of webinars in itself. It's just simply how you store, handle, filter, and deliver the lubricants that you're using. So we'll kind of talk about how ultrasound can eliminate all four of those top uh, four failure modes when it comes to why bearings fail and why bearings fail prematurely. Uh, next slide. Uh, 
Uh, again, another study here, uh, one uh, on the left there from IEEE, which they're kind of the governing body when it comes to, uh, you know, electrical assets. And then EPRI, uh, the Electric Power Research Institute, you know, obviously doing a lot of research primarily with nuclear. Uh, but, you know, nuclear always says that they're different, but, you know, <laughs> really a motor's a motor, a pump's a pump. Um, but, you know, if you look at motor component failure, the majority of mo motor component failures uh, in each one of those studies related directly back to the bearings. You know, you could also throw uh, installation in there. So, uh, you know, a lot of times how we install those bearings, we can eliminate a large number of failure modes just by simply improving our bearing uh, installation practices. And then, you know, when we talk about the concept of using ultrasound for bearing lubrication, it's based off of friction. So uh, when we think about increases in friction, we should also think about increases in temperature. So another uh, part of that study, if you look there, um, you know, the effects of temperature, and then if you look at, um, you know, the... Uh, well, how that can affect the the bearing itself, you know, when you have expansion issues, you have spalling issues, you know, when you have those increases in temperature. So again, we talk about uh, friction and how friction is directly related to increases in temperature. Uh, next slide. So here you see there a visual uh, of some spalling uh, happening there. And again, those are just simply increases in friction, which also uh, increase temperature. And, you know, friction is, is an enemy to our rotating assets. <clears throat> you know, if you look at uh, specifically motor driven equipment, you know, that accounts for 64% of the electricity consumed by US industries. Uh, again, when you have increases in friction, not only do you have increases in temperature, but that friction is also the source of the high frequency sound. So that's what we're detecting with ultrasound instruments. We're listening for or detecting increases in friction. So when you have an increase in friction, there's going to be an in increase in noise. Uh, next slide. So, you know, a, a little bit on the technology itself. So if you're not familiar with ultrasound, you know, uh, I kind of compare it to, you know, some of our other technologies. So it's just like, you know, an infrared camera sees what you can't see. A vibration accelerometer feels what you can't feel. Ultrasound instruments hear what you can't hear. So we're listening for sound that is above the range of normal human hearing. And when we think about how ultrasound relates to normal human hearing, on the average, uh, normal human hearing, kind of the upper threshold of what we're able to hear sound at as humans is around 16 to 17 kilohertz. So with ultrasound, we're listening for sound that is above uh, or 20 kilohertz and above. So uh, even at the lowest frequency that we can tune or set the instrument to, it's still above what we're capable of hearing as humans. So in most cases, we don't have to be too concerned about background noise, you know, just ambient noise. Uh, you know, if you think about some of your plants, you probably have areas where just audibly, you know, there's a lot of background noise, you know, there's equipment running, you know, there's, uh, you know, grinding, welding, there's, you know, motors running, there's forklifts driving by. So in most cases, we don't have to be too concerned about anything that we hear audibly, because we're only hearing and then translating sound uh, that is above what we're capable of hearing. So the instrument or the sensor itself takes the inaudible that we can't hear, and then through a process called heterodyning or translation, it translates that down into an audible that we would hear in the headset. So if we're taking a portable instrument out and we're going out to check bearings, or if we're looking for air leaks, or if we're listening to steam traps, Again, we're listening for sound that we can't hear, and the instrument translates that to what we would hear in the headset. And then the instrument or the sensor will also give us a decibel level reading. So since we're talking about sound, that's the primary number that we're looking at. So in the case of bearings, we're going out and we're taking historical decibel level readings, and we're trending that decibel level over time. If that decibel level starts to increase, then we know that a change has taken place. And uh, when we get later in the presentation, we'll talk about how we can set alarm levels. So uh, we pretty well know at if we have a certain uh, amount of increase above a baseline or above the previous reading, we pretty well know what that problem is. 
Now, there are different sources of high-frequency sound. So we talked about friction. So again, when we have bearings in need of grease, there's going to be an increase in friction, therefore an increase in noise. Uh, other sources are turbulence. Uh, when you have a pressure leak, you know, pressure leak to atmosphere, uh, you know, that creates turbulence. So we actually hear and we can locate the source of a compressed air leak or a compressed gas leak. Uh, if we're listening to a steam trap, you know, we can tell if that steam trap is operating properly or we can tell if there's leak by present and it's all based off of turbulence. Same with valve leakage, you know, we can check a valve to see if a valve is closed or we can check if, to see if a valve is, is open so we can check the health of that valve. Uh, ionization, that's going to be electrical faults like corona discharge or partial discharge. Uh, the thing about, you know, like corona specifically, uh, corona typically will not produce enough heat that's detectable with a standard infrared camera, but it does produce high frequency sound. So if you're only relying on an infrared camera for your electrical inspections, you're not going to be picking up a failure mode like corona discharge just simply because there's not enough heat. Uh, but we can combine the use of ultrasound and infrared and we're pretty well guaranteed to find about any kind of fault that may be occurring. And then impacting, uh, primarily with slow speed bearings. So to us at UE Systems, when we say slow speed bearings, we're talking about anything below 100 RPM. Uh, we even have people using ultrasound on applications uh, that I personally have experienced uh, around one RPM. And it's very easily done. Um, now, the thing is, so if you, I'll just use an example of, let's say a 10 RPM bearing. If you have a, a good 10 RPM bearing, properly installed, properly lubricated, and in a good condition, that 10 RPM bearing is going to produce little to no high frequency sound, uh, just because there's not a lot of energy there, there's not a lot of movement. But what happens is if you have a fault that starts to occur on the rotation, then when that bearing hits that fault, that's going to produce a subtle click or a pop or a tick or a screech. And, you know, not only would you hear that in your headset, but if you record the sound file of it and then play that back and look at that recorded sound file in the time waveform view, uh, those anomalies will show up really nicely in your time waveform. So again, very easy to use ultrasound on slow speed applications. And again, that's where we see a lot of complementary use between ultrasound and vibration. Uh, is going to be on slow speed applications. So, you know, again, certainly if you have the right data collector, the right accelerometer, uh, and then the time to collect the data, uh, you can do vibration, but certainly much easier, much more uh, efficient to do that with ultrasound. Uh, next slide. So, you know, when I started with UE uh, Systems uh, back in 2003, a lot of people still thought of ultrasound as just a compressed air leak detector. Uh, that's what they thought about the technology. Um, you know, it was only good for leak detection. Uh, but I would say, you know, fast forward to today, and the majority of our users are using ultrasound for what I would consider to be more advanced types of applications like bearing condition monitoring, bearing lubrication, and electrical inspection. And, you know, if you're familiar with reliability, uh, you know, one of kind of the, the foundations of reliability is kind of centered around the P to F curve. So in that P to F curve, you know, once we have installed that piece of equipment, um, you know, hopefully we do proactive things when we do an installation like a precision alignment. So if we're installing a, a motor and a pump, for instance, you know, hopefully we do precision alignment to make sure that that piece of equipment is properly aligned before we start it up. If we start up that piece of equipment and we haven't done precision alignment, then we've shortened the time between when we installed it to when we have that point P or now the first potential failure. Uh, and you know, if you look at that, once we have that point P, if you look at any of those P to F curves, uh, ultrasound is the technology shown that will give you the first indicator of a potential problem. So what I mean here by trending the decibel level, if we're trending the decibel level of that bearing, that decibel level becomes a really good leading indicator of a potential problem. Because again, where ultrasound tends to be really good is we're really good at finding these early stage premature type bearing defects. Uh, now also in that proactive area where we can use ultrasound is through 
a, a more precision or condition-based lubrication approach in that if we're not killing our bearings with lubrication, so if we're properly lubricating them with ultrasound, then in a sense, we're extending the life of that bearing, therefore extending the time between when we installed that bearing to when we have that point P or that potential uh, failure. Uh, but once we do have that point P, ultrasound is going to be a really good tool to use that will let us know that we've got a problem and it'll let us know that we've got a problem early. So again, you know, we see a lot of plants, a lot of facilities, they just don't have the luxury of having a very robust vibration analysis program. Uh, you know, we're seeing, uh, for whatever reason, you know, labor shortages, you know, um, you know, cuts in the workforce. You know, we're, we're just not seeing as many level two, level three vibe analysts. Um, so again, because every plant doesn't have the luxury of having a very robust vibration analysis program, the learning curve for ultrasound is much shorter. So, and, and not only can we learn it quickly so it can be implemented sooner, but the same tool that we use for bearing condition monitoring is the same tool that we can use for compressed air leak detection. It's the same tool that we can use for steam trap inspection. It's the same tool that we can use for electrical inspection. So the versatility alone of ultrasound is the reason why we see more and more people starting first. So when they're developing and, and building a condition monitoring program, a lot of times ultrasound is going to be the first place that they start, uh, just simply because they can use the same tool for a multitude of applications. But ultrasound in itself has become a more diagnostic tool. So I mentioned that, you know, we have the ability to record the sound file of what it is that we're listening to. So again, it's not just about listening. It's not just about the decibel level, but we can record the sound of that bearing and we play that sound file back and that's where we get a visual FFT in a time waveform. So we can get into diagnosing exactly what the problem is. Uh, the same with the electrical inspection, you know, corona, tracking, arcing, each one of those have signature characteristics that we look for in either the FFT or the time waveform view. So again, ultrasound in its own right has become a more diagnostic tool thanks to the advancements in instrumentation, software, and the fact that more and more people are complementing vibration analysis and infrared thermography with ultrasound inspections. Uh, next slide. So what equipment is available? Um, at, I know at UE Systems, at least, you know, we have a couple of instruments that are specific to bearing lubrication. Uh, the one on the left that you see, uh, you may be familiar with, it's been around since about 2002. It's called the Ultra Probe 201 Grease Caddy. Uh, by far the easiest instrument that we have to use in that it gives the user an indication. It's just a simple LED bar graph that represents the decibel level. Uh, it's going to give that user an indication as to when they've applied enough grease. So again, if we, what we want to see happening is we want to see those LEDs there on the display. We want to see those falling. So when we, when, if that bearing is in need of grease, as we apply grease to that bearing, there's going to be less friction, therefore less noise. So that person using that or lubricating that bearing will see a decrease in those LEDs. And then once it falls, it's not likely to fall anymore. So once we've seen that decrease, we can stop lubricating. Uh, so it, again, it'll let us know when we've applied enough grease. Now, if that person doing the lubricating is, uh, is starting to apply too much grease, then the reverse happens. So it, as we apply more grease than what's needed, that in turn creates more pressure and friction inside the bearing housing and therefore more noise. So if we're ever applying grease to a bearing and we start to see the, the LEDs in this case, or with the other in, instrument over here, the, the digital version of it, uh, we'd be looking for an actual decibel level number. But either way, if we start to see the LEDs increase or the decibel level increase, that's an indicator to where we have reached the threshold to where we've started to apply too much grease. So that's gonna be an indicator to stop. So. Uh, and both both instruments, we would get a visual here, and then you also would be wearing a headset. So uh, we're going to hear the sound of the bearing as well as get a visual here. So again, the one on the left is just a simple vertical LED bar graph that represents the decibel level. It's designed just to give the user an indication as to when they've applied enough grease. 
the one on the right, uh, same concept. Uh, it's just that instead of looking at a vertical LED bar graph, we're going to get a true decibel level number there on the display. So since we get that true decibel level number, that allows for um, trending. It allows for setting baselines, setting alarm levels. So in the case here, we have a route loaded into it. And so you actually see the name of the point that we're at. So we see that we're at motor two, motor inboard. Uh, so however you name it in the software, when you load that route into here, into the grease caddy, that's how it will show up on the display. So it lets you know where you are at any given time along the route. And then once we've taken those initial baseline readings, you see when we load that route in here, it will bring over the baseline DB for each point as we move along the route. So the user will know what the baseline DB is for that bearing at any given time as they move through the route. The other piece of information here that uh, we can store with this digital version is gonna be the number of pumps of grease that we added. So we see a lot of people wanting to track and trend grease usage. So this, uh, having the ability to store that uh, allows for the, the uh, uh, tracking and then trending of how much grease we're using. So, however, it, just as an example, if we apply four pumps of grease to a bearing, we can actually input in that we only put four pumps of grease to that bearing. So when we save that information, download that into the software, <clears throat> we, we give you some lubrication specific fields over there. So for instance, you have the actual number of pumps of grease compared to what was planned. So if you had a planned PEM for that bearing, you would just enter how many the, the uh, pumps of grease were planned compared to what we actually used. And, you know, another good practice, and uh, if I was in an audience, you know, a live setting, I would ask this question, and I guarantee nobody would raise their hands, but, you know, think about, do you calibrate your grease guns? And more times than not, nobody does that. But, you know, we need to know at a full pump of grease how much is coming out of there. So we can either calibrate our grease guns and then write that or record that somewhere on the grease gun itself to where we know at a full pump of grease how much is coming out. Or we could choose to use a, a metered style grease gun so we know at every pump of grease how much is coming out of there. So we give you fields of information uh, to if we know the number of pumps and then if we know uh, the mass per pump. <clears throat> and then we also give you a field of information for the cost of the grease. So if we know how much that tube of grease is costing, then we not only know how many pumps we used, we know how much mass we used, and then we know how much dollar wise we use. So then there's a really nice report in there that we can generate. It's called a, it's called a lube field report in the software, but really it's a lubrication cost benefit and loss report. So it, it will tell us how much we've saved uh, through condition-based lubrication. So again, most time we see that it's too much too often. So then we can put that into a savings and we can actually put a dollar amount to it. And uh, you know, for ma people in maintenance and reliability, anytime we can show a savings for what it is that we're doing, uh, that's a plus because uh, most people think as, of maintenance as a call center, you know, oh, we've got to buy this equipment. Oh, you need to go to training. But, you know, they don't see it as an investment. You know, they just look at it as a call center. But again, anytime we can show documentation for how much we've saved and, and have a dollar amount to that, you know, that's only going to showcase exactly what it, maintenance and reliability is for. And that's, you know, again, uh, showing savings and improving asset reliability overall. Uh, next slide. So we've already kind of touched on this, but again, I would I would dare say that the majority of you on the, the webinar today and, and those of you listening in the future, you know, you probably lubricate your equipment based off of timed intervals. So we go out to a piece of equipment, PM says six pumps of grease every six weeks. So that's what we do. The, you know, the problem with that is, you know, the inherent risk is to over lubricate because, you know, what if the specified amount of grease is too much or too little? What if the frequency, how often we're lubricating that bearing is too often or not enough? And then what if there are other problems wrong with the bearing itself? So what if we're applying grease to bearings that are failing, uh, that are in a bad condition and need replacement or some sort of further uh, maintenance or inspection? 
So you can kind of see that a lot of times we're applying grease to bearings that don't even need grease uh, through just simply time-based lubrication alone. So, you know, we talk more about moving to a condition-based approach as opposed to just simply a time-based approach. Uh, next slide. So what can we expect to, to see and then hear? So if you could kind of click through this. You know, really there's three things uh, and what we want to see happening again is if that bearing needs grease, the decibel level will fall as grease is added. So if we get out there and let's say that bearing is already sufficiently lubricated and doesn't need any grease, the response is typically pretty quick on, on, on the instrument. So typically just after, you know, two, three pumps of grease, the decibel level will start to slowly increase. So again, if we are ever applying grease to a bearing and the decibel level starts to increase, that's going to be an indicator there that we need to stop applying grease. You know, we've kind of reached the threshold where we've started to apply more grease than what's needed. And really the third scenario, the third thing that we can expect to see and hear is if we're out there and applying grease and there's no change in the decibel level, and I, and I see this, uh, I won't say a lot, but I, I see it uh, a fair amount. But, you know, why why is that? So usually what we've seen is through previous over lubrication, if the seal has been compromised and now all that grease that we're pumping in is going out into areas of that equipment where it shouldn't be. Therefore, that's going to cause little to no change in the decibel level. Uh, and then also if the bearing is in a failure mode, that's beyond a lack of lubrication. So again, we're applying grease to bearings that are already failing or already damaged. You know, that, that's going to cause little to no change in the decibel level. You know, lubrication may hide it temporarily, but that decibel level is going to come back really quickly uh, because again, lubrication is not the solution there. So next slide. So we talk about these three approaches. So we, you know, we just simply called it good, better, and best. So the, a good approach to bearing lubrication is if you're going to continue on time-based lubrication PMs, you know, at least add in an ultrasound device to use while greasing at that timed interval. Uh, again, at, at least this will let them know, let the lubricator know when they've applied enough grease or if they've started to apply too much. Uh, more problems will be found. So you think about, you know, if we just go out with a, a standard grease gun and we just apply grease to a bearing, we're not listening to that bearing. So a bearing that is, uh, a bearing that has physical damage is going to sound a lot different. It's going to have a much higher decibel level than a bearing that's just in need of lubrication. So we're going to identify more problems than just through traditional time-based lubrication with just a grease gun alone. Um, we see a lot of people adjusting their time-based lubrication PMs based off of what ultrasound tells them. So again, let's say if we've got a PM for a bearing and it says six pumps of grease, but if we're using ultrasound and let's say the decibel level falls after four pumps of grease, then there's no reason to put two more pumps of grease into that bearing. At that point, we're going to run the risk of applying too much grease. Uh, or, you know, if that bearing is sufficiently lubricated, and if we have that PM and it calls for six pumps of grease, but let's say after three pumps of grease, the decibel level starts to increase. So again, that's going to be an indicator there to where we don't need to put three more pumps of grease into that bearing. So again, your time-based lubrication PMs can be adjusted based off of what your results are from ultrasound. But it is very typical. Uh, we have kind of across the board seen a reduction of at least 30% in grease consumption once um, ultrasound assisted lubrication has been implemented. Uh, next slide. So in the good approach, what equipment would be used? You know, again, consider using a standard hand pump style grease gun, preferably a newer metered style grease gun. Uh, some of the newer uh, battery powered grease guns, normally I'm, I'm not a fan of the battery powered grease guns because I've seen cases to where, you know, uh, people keep their finger on the trigger a little too long. And then the next thing you know, you got, you know, visual, visual grease. Uh, and, and that's, that's not a good thing. <clears throat> but some of the newer battery powered grease guns that I've seen actually have a metering device built into it. So you can set it for a specific amount. And once it reaches that amount, 
it's going to shut off. So it, 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 it's kind of a safety thing in that you, you're not going to have your finger on the trigger too long. Once you, or once it reaches that predetermined amount, it's going to shut off. Um, but in, in this case, you know, like something like the Ultra Probe 201, uh, just that simple to use analog version of the Grease Caddy uh, would be appropriate. Again, it's just going to give the lubricator uh, an indicator of when they've applied enough grease or if they've started to apply too much. So, the, you know, again, consider the skill level of the technician, uh, but and then what the ultimate goal is. So if you'd like to establish routes, if you want to get into trending, setting baselines, setting alarm levels, report generation with our ultrasound data, then that would be like that Ultra Probe 401, the digital grease caddy. Uh, that one would give you those capabilities. Uh, next slide. So in the better approach, you know, that kind of leads into uh, talking about, you know, collecting data. But in the better approach, we would set up routes to where we're taking regular data on those assets. So that's going to be where we would establish a route. We would set baseline uh, DB readings on those bearings. And then based off of that baseline, we would then set two alarm levels. So what's recommended in that ISO standard that I referenced earlier, that ISO 29821, in that standard, it says if you have an 8 dB increase above your baseline, that represents a lack of lubrication. So that's going to be just, again, a uniform increase in friction. No physical damage yet, but it's just letting us know, hey, it's time to add grease. And then at 16 dB above the baseline, that's going to be the point now to where that bearing is now entered the that point P, if you will. So uh, we're kind of into that predictive area to where we can now identify that fault with a predictive technology like ultrasound. Um, so it's going to be the case now to where uh, that bearing has started to show some wear or fatigue. Uh, and then, you know, we would only apply grease to the bearings that are currently in that low alarm condition or in that lack of lubrication condition. So this is kind of where we talk about instead of a time based approach, it becomes more of a condition based approach in that instead of applying grease to everything, we're only applying grease to bearings that are in need of grease or where ultrasound has said, hey, it's time to be greased. Uh, next slide. Okay, so in, in this approach, again, we would lubricate uh, based on condition rather than time alone. Uh, now, for more critical assets, you know, it, uh, I do see where it's kind of a, a best practice. So if you have uh, assets that are of a high criticality ranking and for additional diagnostics, you know, we can re-record the sound file. And uh, in the spectralizer software uh, that comes with our instruments, you can overlay. So you can do a comparison between your baseline sound file and then your current alarm level sound file. Uh, but this also allows you to use that ultrasound data to generate uh, some really nice reports. So we can, uh, you know, if we've got to make a call to, you know, hey, if we've got to have two hours of downtime to make a change out, you know, we better make sure that we've got our proper reporting and documentation to back up our need for, for that, uh, for that downtime to get that uh, asset changed out. So again, that's where your data becomes very critical in that we can use that to uh, do report generation, but then also we can show the cost savings when it comes to uh, how much grease we have uh, reduced uh, our consumption by. Uh, next slide. So in this uh, better approach, you know, what equipment would be used? Again, that Ultra Probe 401, the digital version that we talked about, um, you know, as far as like getting into more of the diagnostic side of ultrasound, again, we can use instruments that have onboard sound file recording. And that is where we start to get into doing, you know, FFT and time waveform analysis to where we can identify exactly what the fault is. Uh, I know with uh, our software, at least, you have the ability to enter in the speed and then the number of balls or the number of bearings. And it has a bearing fault frequency calculator that will calculate out based off the speed and the number of balls or the number of bearings. Uh, it'll calculate out an outer race, inner race, ball pass, and cage fault frequencies. Or, you know, based off of your vibration data, uh, we can enter in a specific fault frequency that we're looking for. And then you have a harmonic marker that you can turn on 
to look to to see if uh, any of those harmonic markers line up with any of our peaks on our FFT. So again, it has become a more diagnostic tool on its own because we do have the ability to do that type of analysis on uh, you know, recorded sound files in the FFT or the time waveform. Uh, next slide. So in this best approach that we talk about, and I kind of alluded to it a little bit in the beginning, but, you know, all, you know, lubrication now becomes more precise and more prescriptive in that we're continuously monitoring the bearing through an ultrasonic sensor. And then we also tie in a single point lubricator. Uh, now, previous to this, I wasn't really a, a big fan of single point lubricators just because you know, they have to be maintained, you know, the batteries die, uh, they, the, the grease cartridge empties, they've got to be refilled, uh, they get knocked off, they get broken. Uh, and a lot of times they are put into areas where uh, most people are not going to go up there frequently anyway. And that's why we put a single point lubricator in there because, you know, it's in a hard to reach area or it's in an unsafe area. So it's in an, it's in an area where it tends to be a little overlooked. But um, through this uh, system, we actually have the ability to monitor the health of the single point lubricator itself. So we know the battery life. We know the remaining uh, grease, how much grease is left in the cartridge. So uh, all of that can be monitored through this system. So again, if we're monitoring that bearing with ultrasound, um, it's going to give us a very early indication of bearing wear fatigue. And then it's also give us uh, an indication as to when that bearing needs grease and that single point lubricator will apply a little bit of grease at a time until that friction level comes back down to a more normal uh, level. So this is kind of where, you know, again, we're seeing uh, a lot of people implement this who are doing uh, IIoT projects to where, you know, they're, they're uh, retrofitting plants or they're building new facilities that are sensor based uh and this is going to be a good fit uh for those types of scenarios but also you know again we talk about equipment that's just inaccessible you know maybe it's in a hazardous area maybe it's in a remote area a hard to reach area uh and we can um use this type of system to where we're continuously monitoring those bearings and we know that that bearing is going to get the right amount of grease at the right time at the right frequency uh next slide And uh, you can just go ahead and click through this, Heather. It's just a simple animation. But, you know, we, we haven't really talked about sensor placement or where we want to make contact. But, you know, we talk about ultrasound being high frequency sound. Well, high frequency sound by nature is very low energy. <clears throat> so it tends not to travel very far from the source. So we want to make contact, whether it be with a handheld, uh, you know, a magnetic mount style contact probe or a stethoscope style contact probe, or in this case where we're, we're mounting sensors. Um, we want to mount those sensors or we want to make contact, ideally the closest point to the bearing. So the closer we are to the bearing, the better uh, ability we have into picking up uh, the sound of that bearing. So again, by nature, it's very low energy so that sound is not going to travel very far from the source so the closer we are to that bearing the more ideal it is so in this case we're mounting sensors to the bearings we're also tying in single point lubricators and all those are coming back to uh, this on track system now the data from this on track system uh, you know, speaking, you know, on behalf of the system, but we left it as an open platform so you're free to do with that data as you see fit, you know, as you being the customer, you know, we wanted it to be an open platform. Uh, so we know that people want to move their data into other areas, you know, you may have some sort of some sort of existing monitoring system or, you know, cloud in this case that you're using. Uh, if not, uh, then there's a cloud based dashboard called UE insights that that data can go to. Uh, that can be accessed from anywhere in the world, from any, you know, uh, internet enabled device. So again, that uh, data is going to the cloud. It's going to let us know when those bearings are in need of grease or once they've entered into that high level alarm. And we can actually lubricate that bearing remotely. So in that insights dashboard, there's a lubricate option. So we can actually pull up that bearing that needs grease 
we can lubricate it from the luxury of our desk or you know, if, we're, if we happen to be on vacation and we get alert an alert or an alarm that a bearing needs grease back at the plant, uh, we can actually lubricate that remotely and then watch in real time, uh, hopefully those friction levels coming back down to a more normal level. So this is really what has become the best approach when it comes to lubrication. Again, it ties in the remote monitoring piece as well as the uh, prescriptive lubrication piece. Uh, next slide. So this is just a little closer up view of the dashboard itself. Uh, you know, we, we help you build the dashboards according to what you want to see and how you want it laid out. Um, but again, it, you typically you'll see these little uh, needle type readouts that are just kind of a quick, easy visual of what's going on with that bearing and what the current condition is. The image that you see there in the middle, that's uh, where I was talking about how we're able to see the remaining uh, volume of grease in that grease cartridge. Um, you know, we talk about the battery life, uh, the battery life on these single point lubricators, they're rated for five years, which uh, typically that's going to outlive the life or the, the use of the, the gr grease cartridge itself. So when you reorder a service pack, it's going to come with a pre-filled grease cartridge of whatever you specify, as well as a new battery. So when you change out the grease, you change out the battery, you do it all at one time. Uh, next slide. So getting uh, fairly close to wrapping up here, but, you know, if we think about these three approaches, you know, in any approach, we should think about cleanliness and cleanliness could be just something as simple as wiping off that Zerk fitting before we connect up that grease nozzle. Uh, we talked about using a calibrated or a metered grease gun. So again, we're making it more specific in that instead of saying a specific number of pumps of grease, which you may have two identical grease guns, each one may be pumping out a, you know, a totally different amount. So instead of saying certain number of pumps, we're making it more precise in, in saying a certain specified amount of grease. So a, a specific, you know, grams or ounces. Um, so we're making it more specific. Uh, you know, again, a lot of you probably have equipment that's just inaccessible due to uh, safety, guarding, or just distance. Uh, so the only way to get around that is if we want to be able to listen to that bearing while we're applying grease would be through the use of some sort of remote access sensor. And then mostly with, um, you know, tr the traditional handheld type data collection, you know, we think about the repeatability of what we're doing. We want to make it as repeatable or consistent as possible. So we want to make sure that we have good procedures in place uh, for not only what the tool will be used for, but then also how that tool, in this case, ultrasound will be used. So we wanna make sure that we're making contact in the same location every single time. Uh, we wanna make sure that we're using the same frequency setting on the ultrasound instrument every single time. And then also using the same contact method, whether that be a stethoscope style contact probe or a magnetic mount contact probe. Uh, we want to make it as repeatable and consistent as possible. Uh, next slide. So in any approach, we also think about what instrument is needed. Uh, so part of that, you know, we was talking about the, the skill level of the people that will be using it. We want to make sure that they are properly trained. We want to make sure that they understand the importance of proper lubrication and how important that is to the overall reliability of the assets that they've been uh, placed in care for. Uh, we talked about procedures. You know, a lot of times we don't see the success of the pro um, the success of the program doesn't rely on having the best tool. The overall success of the program really is procedures, making sure that we have procedures for uh, how those assets will be monitored, how they will be greased, and then also procedures that allow for the use of our condition monitoring tools, whether that be, you know, vibration, infrared, uh, ultrasound. Um, and then also we think about our lubrication PMs, you know, how often or how long has it been since those have been updated? Uh, are they even applicable for the assets that they were originally written for. So take a look at your lubrication PMs. And then if ultrasound is going to be implemented for condition-based lubrication or ultrasound-assisted lubrication, 
then uh, we want to rewrite and update those PMs to reflect the use of ultrasound or you know, the technology of choice. Uh, next slide. So here, uh, just a little closer up view of the, in this case, this is our route building software. So if you look over there in the right hand corner, um, you know, you'll see those lubrication specific fields that I talked about. So you see the actual number of pumps of grease compared to what was planned. You see, we give you a field there for mass per pump. So that's going to come from having that calibrated or metered grease gun. And then you see there for the cost of the grease. So again, if we know how much that tube of grease is costing, we can then know how much grease we're using uh, dollar wise as well. We even give you a feel there for uh, when it's time to calibrate the grease gun. So we, we try to make it as easy as possible. But if, if, if you don't get anything else out of this webinar, you know, go immediately and calibrate your grease guns. Uh, next slide. So here you see a uh, just a, a plot. Uh, so what we're looking at, we're looking at a plot of these historical decibel level readings over time. So we're plotting those against a, a baseline and then a low alarm and a high alarm. So you can see the most current reading that's been taken, this bearing is now into the high alarm stage. The little bottom plot there with the, the blue and the black line there. <clears throat> so that blue line is gonna be the plan number of pumps grease. The black line directly below it is going to be the actual number of pumps of grease. So if you notice there, a lot of times we applied no grease to that bearing and ultrasound let us know that. So uh, you can track and trend that visually. Uh, next slide. And then here you see uh, this is that lubrication fields report or that lubrication cost benefit and loss report. Uh, that I mentioned earlier. So this one was emailed to me. It's from a, an actual route that was done by one of our, our customers, you know, who had implemented this. This is only uh, for one of their, I think, dozen routes that they were using uh, ultrasound on for lubrication. But, you know, just kind of a breakdown. Uh, I know it's a little bit of an eye chart, but the most important piece is what we're showing up here at the top. So the planned number of pumps of grease for this route was 5,550 pumps of grease. Uh, but they were using ultrasound, so they only had to use 247 pumps. So the total injected mass, so how much grease they actually used, was about 6.42, uh, I think, grams here. So the planned cost for that grease, they planned to use $90.44 worth of that grease, but they only used $4.02. So they had a savings of $86.40 for that one route. And this was only one of about a dozen routes. Uh, so again, all that information is uh, populated from those uh, lubrication specific fields back in that that ultra trend DMS software uh, that we collected as we were going through and uh, taking data on those uh, bearings. Uh, next slide. So we've got a couple of visuals here and I'm going to uh, I'll tell you we'll, we'll finish up the PowerPoint and then I will uh, I'll share the software and I'll actually play some sound files for you. Uh, that way you can not only see it, but then also hear uh, what we can be expecting. Uh, so the, the screenshots that we're seeing here, these time waveforms, the one on the left is a bearing that was properly lubricated to where on the left you see a very high increase in amplitude or noise. Grease was added and then you see uh, moving uh, left to right there, you see kind of a nice fall back down to a more normal level and then we stopped greasing. The one on the right shows what happens when we start to apply too much grease. So on the left, you see a high increase in amplitude, and then you see a nice fall back down to a more normal level, but they continue to add grease. And you can just about see every pump of grease thereafter, how uh, the amplitude or the noise increased. So again, this bearing is now in an over lubrication condition. Uh, next slide. All right, so kind of wrapping up here, um, you know, again, for many, lubrication is kind of a guessing game. So if you want to make sure that the people responsible for lubricating your equipment have better confidence 
in what they're doing. You know, ultrasound is a great technology. It's easy to use, and it's going to give them an indicator as to when they've applied enough grease or if they've started to apply too much. Um, it's also going to allow for better insight to the overall health of that asset. Again, because we're actually listening and we have a quantitative number, so we have a decibel level number that we can put to that bearing, and now we can trend that bearing uh, decibel level over time. So if that decibel level starts to increase, we pretty well know uh, based off the amount of increase, either above a previous reading or above a baseline, uh, we pretty well know what that is. is. Is it in need of grease or is it now in a failure mode that's beyond a lack of lubrication? And then because we're not greasing bearings that don't need grease uh, by doing or performing unnecessary lubrication PMs on those bearings, that allows us more time to be spent on more productive work. So instead of, um, instead of causing a failure mode through over lubrication, now we're hopefully reducing the risk or the chance that we are over or under lubricating that bearing. Uh, but, you know, using online monitoring, you know, the, the facility that I was at this morning uh, right outside of Atlanta, Georgia, you know, they specifically said, you know, we don't have the manpower to send people out to perform lubrication related tasks like we used to. So they're looking for an online solution. And uh, again, I'm, I'm hearing that from more and more plants, more and more facilities. And it's valid reasons, you know, the fact that the majority of bearing failures can be attributed to lubrication. A lot of people are starting to rethink their lubrication practices. Uh, next slide. So going back to those failure modes that we talked about early on, um, you know, we talked about lubricant contamination, unsuitable or incorrect lubricant. A uh, long time without renewing, so a long time between lubrication uh, frequencies or how often we are lubricating that bearing. And then insufficient lubricant quantity, meaning under lubrication. You know, so if you're just using a grease gun alone, you're not going to eliminate any of these failure modes. You know, we still run the risk of contamination or using the wrong grease for the wrong application. Uh, frequency issues are still a problem, and then is insufficient lubricant quantity. Are we applying enough grease or are we applying too much grease? So we think about installing just an automatic lubricator alone. Yeah, so that helps us to eliminate contamination, meaning that that lubricant is now contained within that sealed uh, cartridge. So that helps to eliminate contamination. It also helps to ensure that we're using the same grease or the right grease every single time, but it still doesn't solve our, you know, frequency and then insufficient lubricant quantity. So a lot of times we see where these single point lubricators are set incorrectly to where we're still not applying the right amount of grease at the right times. And then, you know, we talked about implementing a grease caddy or, you know, an ultrasonic device to use while, you know, listening to the bearing and watching the decibel level. Well, that doesn't help with contamination or, you know, using the correct grease or the same grease every single time. But it does help with, you know, long time without renewing or the frequency, how often we're greasing that bearing. It also helps to make sure that we're applying the correct amount of grease every single time. Um, but then if you look at, you know, the online solutions that are available where it ties in the, the bearing monitoring as well as the single point lubricator, that helps to eliminate all four of those failure modes. You know, we get the, connect, get the contamination piece from that single point lubricator. Uh, we're using the same grease or the right grease every single time. We're lubricating that bearing more prescriptive or precisely, and then we're lubricating that bearing uh, with the correct amount every single time. Um, any, oh, uh, uh, next slide. I think there might be one more slide. Okay, so it's just a conclusion slide here. So um, I'm gonna share now um, the Spectralizer software. So I'm gonna pull this up and hopefully you'll be able to see that. If not, uh, no big deal. Uh, it's not a, not a huge deal breaker. Uh, so maybe while this is coming up, uh, Heather, did we have any questions come in? We did. We had a handful of questions come in throughout the presentation. Um, 
Uh, in the interest of time, I would love to send them to you after, if you are able to spend a few minutes, you know, answering those um, with like over email with me, and then I'll I'll share those along with the replay in the community tomorrow. Sure. Um, but we can go ahead and take a couple minutes. I think most of our, our live audience is still here, which is awesome. Thank you all for for sticking with us. Um, so I I think maybe let's just run through those sound bites, and then we'll answer questions offline. Well, it's not going to allow me to pull up that spectralizer. So I tell you what, if you if you want those sound files, I can email those to you. And that way you'll be able to play them uh, and you'll have them. Uh, but they are bearings in the process of being lubricated and it, it'll be obvious. Uh, so you'll actually hear the noise start out really high. And then gradually as grease is added, there'll be a decrease in friction. You'll actually visually hear and then see the noise level falling back down to a more normal level. So, uh, yeah, I'll be glad to email those out to anyone on the call today. Uh, don't mind sharing those at all. Awesome. Uh, well, I just popped the, the contact slide back up. So please feel free to to send a, a request for those over to Adrian. His email is on the screen. Um, he's also in the, the community as well. So you can reach out to him there or on LinkedIn, I believe, as well. Um, Ahmed, you will get those recordings, Steve. <laughs> um, thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. Adrian, thank you for an awesome presentation. Um, again, I'll, I'll send you those questions shortly, and then we can get some answers out to the to the team tomorrow. Awesome. Looking forward to uh, responding back to those. So awesome. uh, thank you for that. Thank you. Thanks for bearing with me through some uh, technical troubles. And um, I hope everyone has an awesome rest of their day. Thank you once again for making the time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.